everybody welcome to instagram live for michael harding i've taken over the channel for this afternoon to do some live color mixing i've got my palette all set out i thought i'd give you a little hello and a quick glimpse of some of my paintings here in my studio in bridge north in england and i've had loads of requests for fantastic color mixes so i don't know how many i'm going to get done we'll just play this by ear see how it goes so we're going to try and flip and um, point the camera down now at my palette and I'll start talking about who's sent mixes in. Thank you so much for joining me. I can see you all coming in. This is really exciting. Hi. Okay. Okay, so you should now be seeing lots of lovely colours ready to go on my palette here. Um, there's tons squeezed out, but whether I'll get to use all of them, I don't know. We'll see. We'll just see how the time goes, I guess. Um, so to start off with, I thought we'd begin with um, quinacridone gold since that's the one that we put on the post. Um, so that's down here at the front. I've got my gloves on today because I'll be using some lead white I think at some point so I'm just being cautious there. Um, so the quinacridone gold here is this, it's amazing, it's just amazing greenish gold colour. Really strong, um, really powerful pigment and I've got this grey palette behind it so you can't really see the transparency so well. Um, I might see if I can just grab a white board and slip that underneath part way through this. So let's just try it with some titanium white and you can begin to see it's a really nice honey gold colour. It's more acidic somehow when it's transparent but when I put white with it it goes more creamy, sort of flattens it a bit. Um, it reminds me somehow of Indian yellow red shade but obviously it's more browny orangey than that. Um, but it just kind of reminds me of that. It feels like it's in the same colour family somehow. Um, so if I try it with, somebody um, asked me if I could mix with indigo to see what kind of greens it makes. So let's just try this with some indigo in here and see. We're getting really kind of dark bottle green. I think I have done this mix on YouTube. We've had quite a few requests in for colour mixes. Um, some of the people have requested mixes that I've already done on YouTube on my Vicky Norman YouTube channel so you could pop over there and have a look and I've, I think this is one of the mixes that came up so you can see that's like a really deep bottle green if I bring some of this lighter mix into it that's a really nice soft foliage kind of green if I bring more indigo in it'll move it more towards a blue green but actually that's a really useful green um, I love this um, quinacridone gold because it's got so much red to it it makes really soft um, tertiary colours straight away. We could try it with something a bit hotter. Let's try some quinacridone rose in there. Somebody else asked me to mix with this, so I'll pop some of that in. That's just a gorgeous hot red pink. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? That's like raspberries. <laughs> that's great. Um, and then mixing out to something slightly more flesh tone, actually, just a bit too fresh for a flesh tone, but with a touch of the green, it might soften it. It's amazing, isn't it? Just three colours, how much you can get out of them. So the quinacridone gold is really fun. I love it as just a really thin kind of glaze colour. I've just got a white board here. Let me see if I can slip that under this palette without having a disaster. So you can see it, if you were glazing with it, it's almost a, got a greenish note to it, even though it's kind of orangey. If you can see in the really thin bits, it's, it's quite acidic somehow. Um, and if you used other transparents with it you could get some really fabulous glaze colours so if I just mix that quinacridone rose in without any white gosh look at that really bright red, ruby red you've had a question what is the main colour you're using? thank the, you Sarah M. Johnson asked ok somebody's asked me the main colour I'm using here at the moment is quinacridone gold um, so we're just kind of test driving that to begin with so that's the base colour. Here it's with indigo, here I've just put it with uh, quinacridone rose and with some white added. So we're just using three colours so far, but here it is transparent and this is with white in. So it's really interesting just adding the white, what a difference that's making to those colours. I feel like I want to do the indigo in there now, because that's also transparent. So these would be great for glazing. The luminosity is fantastic over the white board. There's a really nice earthy brown coming through. It's amazing how you can mix things that behave a bit like earth colours with such strong pigments. So there's the quinacridone gold to start us off. 
Beside it on the palette here, I've put out some burnt sienna and somebody was asking about raw sienna. So I thought that might be a nice little progression to go through those. And also I put some raw umber just in case. Um, I had quite a bit of fun just squeezing the paints out this afternoon, deciding what to put out. So if we compare um, burnt sienna, which in its, you know, straight out of the tube, they look quite similar, um, but it's much thicker. I don't know if you can hear it. We haven't got my normal mic plugged in. I'm just using the camera microphone, so I don't know how good your sound is, but this is more, much more reddish and it's stiffer and it's got a sort of more, slightly more granular feel to it. We've had another question. Um, asking how will it work with making flesh tones? Somebody's asking how it will work with making flesh tones. I guess that means the quinacridone gold. So we used it here with quinacridone rose and some white and it went quite fleshy there. But the burnt sienna is one I see used quite a lot for flesh tones. I'll try a lead white with this. It's a bit softer for flesh. Um, and it straight away moves into something really helpful. Burnt sienna is just a brilliant colour all by itself. It's kind of semi-transparent um, or semi-opaque. I should read the tube, shouldn't I, before I make things up. <laughs> so there it is with just white and it's straight away something really useful for figure. It might be slightly on the red side. Um, the raw sienna leans much more towards a yellow. So it's like a darker, more transparent version of a yellow ochre, if you like. Um, only it isn't, it's, it's a totally different colour. But again, it has that slightly granular feel, um, slightly thicker, and I'm really enjoying working with raw sienna a bit at the moment. And if we pop that into the flesh mix straight away, we're into something really, really usable, really easily. Um, and these are, these are not expensive, they're series one paints. The lead white is a little bit more. You could do this with titanium white. You would just use less of the titanium white um, because it's so powerful. So there's the titanium white. Can you see it makes it bluer? Titanium white always seems to make things seem bluer to me. It's so cold. It sort of brings out the bluish red note in that burnt sienna. Um, I'm just going to take the white away so that we're looking at everything against a grey palette again. I'll pop that white in again if I do some more transparent work. So the the raw sienna on its own is, is quite lovely. Um, but it makes great greens, um, perhaps with a bit of ultramarine. You can make some really helpful soft, soft olive colours. Um, and you can, again, you can just raise the value just with some, some white in there. It's really quite versatile, but it's very soft. It's not got a high tint strength, neither has the burnt sienna, but I'd say the raw sienna feels e a little lower even than the burnt sienna. Um, so yeah, I, hand I handle them quite gently. I, I perhaps wouldn't be inclined to use something as strong as these these sort of more dye pigments, the quinacridones and stronger families. I would tend to stick more with softer, lower tinting paints. And you have a lorry coming down um, you might be hearing a beeping. We've got a lorry going by outside the studio. Um, so you definitely know we're live, don't you? Here we've got some um, Cobalt Violet Deep. That's the similar... It just feels like it kind of belongs with this sienna, you know, these soft, gentle colours. I mean, you can mix anything with anything. I just find that if I mix these gentle colours with some of the more powerful ones, you kind of lose the subtle qualities in the gentle ones. So by gentle, I just mean lower tint strength softer, um, less saturated colours to begin with. Look at that, isn't that great? It's a lovely kind of mushroomy, aubergine browny, purpley, <laughs> really useful colour though. I like that a lot. That was just raw sienna with cobalt violet deep and there was a touch of white in there. Um, this is so nice just pushing paint around. I haven't really got a plan here. I'm just, just putting things together to see what happens. So that's more of the burnt sienna. I'm wondering what happens if I put that with the cobalt violet. Oh, yum. Crikey, that is nice. Look at that. Wow. I hope that's coming over on the camera. That's really yummy. I'll add a touch of white, but it's actually got a really lovely richness to it with no white in it. Um, but if we just put a little bit of white through, it'll cool it off. See how much more plummy it is than the one we had with the raw sienna. So the burnt sienna's just got much more red note to it and it's bringing out the purple in the violet a bit more. Oh, there's only a little bit of room left. I'll have to scrape some, I think. So there's quite a long time delay between um, me actually doing something and you seeing it. So the questions might seem a little bit out of sync. 
um, we're just going to have to work with that. So I'm just going to scrape this beautiful paint away to make room for some more. So I had lots of questions about turquoises. Lots of people wanted me to mix sort of turquoisey greens and things. So I thought I might do a big comparison because it's not something I've done before. And I think it might be useful for me and you to figure out um, what's the difference between some of these turquoises because there's quite a lot of blue greens in the range now. And with the lovely new cobalt teal blue shade, I thought we could do with having a bit of a try out here and see what happens. So I'm just going to have to take a minute to just clean down that first mix. It's amazing how far the paint goes. I could just do with a little wipe. Mark's here helping me, bless him. Those of you that know Mark, <laughs> I would be lost without Mark. Okay, so I'll just give that a quick wipe down. What are you wiping down with? Um, this is just a, a baby wipe, but I managed to get some of those, the kind of biodegradable, not so awful ones. Um, so I'm hoping it's not bad for the environment. Um, so there we go. That's better. Let's start fresh. So this time I'm going to just try out. So I had requests to mix um, cobalt teal, cobalt teal blue shade. Somebody was asking about Thalo Green Lake, um, Caribbean turquoise. So I thought, okay, let's throw in some phthalo turquoise. So these are all down here, this side. And I thought, let's just, let's just do a comparison, see what happens. Um, so let's just run down the line. We've got phthalo turquoise here, which is um, phthalo green, titanium white. And I think that's it mixed together in there. Okay. And then this one is Caribbean turquoise, which has no white in it. But again, it's Thalo family colours. Um, so these are proprietary mixes, if you like, um, ready mixed colours. But you can see how inky that one is. Again, I'll get that white underneath so you can tell which ones are transparent. This is quite frantic doing it all at once. <laughs> I normally get time to wipe down and think about what I'm going to say about the next ones. It's quite fun doing it under pressure. Okay, so the next one I thought would be Cobalt Turquoise Deep, which is another opaque, but it's darker and greener than this Thalo Turquoise. Makes the Thalo Turquoise look really quite blue. Then I've got Cobalt Teal Blue Shade. I haven't tried this before. This is a new baby and it looks absolutely scrummy. And then I've got Normal Cobalt Teal. They're much stiffer. Um, much, much stiffer and more opaque, quite flat, matte appearance to them compared with some of the others here. I think that's just the nature of the pigment. It's just how it is, but they're definitely stiffer. And you can definitely see a difference. The blue shade speaks more to the Thalo turquoise, though it's lighter, richer and slightly more green than the Thalo turquoise is, but it's not as green as the standard cobalt teal there, which is one of my favourite ever colours. And then the phthalo green, I've put it on the end because it, it's so scary, <laughs> it's so bright. Um, but you can see that's much greener than any of the others. Though if we add white to it, it'll, it'll come more towards a blue. So I thought let's try that first, let's put some white into those transparents so that they're all sort of a similar opacity and value. Um, so this is phthalo green with white going in. And you can see it is definitely still quite a bit more green than anything else in the row. But it's such a blue green. As greens go, it's very blue green. We've had a question from Tara O'Reilly Art. Uh, what's in okay. cobalt teal? Cobalt teal is a single pigment. Um, so I've got the tube here. It's um, yeah, it's just a single pigment on its own. There's nothing else mixed into it. Um, pigment number for the cobalt teal is PG50, pigment green 50, um, and it's a single metallic pigment coming from the cobalt family. And then the cobalt teal blue shade has the same pigment number, so sometimes it just depends how the pigments are processed. There can be really subtle differences and they still assign the same pigment number. Um, so they've got the same chemical compounds, they're just slightly processed slightly differently, so it brings out a slightly different colour. 
So that's why one manufacturer's um, colour will, will differ from another, even though they may have the same name. So yellow ochre, for example, they've got the same pigment number and the same name, but they vary drastically from one, per one make to another. And that just it depends on where they've sourced the pigments from and how they've been handled. In other instances, they're actually using different pigments. So um, then it gets really confusing. Like some manufacturers are actually putting phthalo green in a tube and calling it Terra Vert. And I have Terra Vert here, I should show it to you. It's the most soft, beautiful earth green. Um, but it's absolutely nothing like phthalo green. <laughs> so I don't really get how it could go in a tube with the same name. Um, I put some titanium white there into the cobalt turquoise, which is this deeper greeny turquoise here. Um, and you can see how much softer it is. I put roughly the same amount of white, if not less, than I did into the phthalo green. Um, so the phthalo green lake is much more powerful. It's really tinted the white very strongly, whereas here, I'm having to get more of the cobalt turquoise. Cobalts don't tend to be very high tinting, any of them, cobalt, blues, violets, they're all fairly gentle colours. Um, so I'm having to add more of the cobalt turquoise there to make that white tint down to the same value as everything else, or roughly. And you can see it's greyer, much greyer than the teals. Um, that would be great for a British coastal scene, that kind of grey-green that we get in the sea. Um, but yeah, much less intense than the teals because these obviously don't have white in, they're just opaque in their nature anyway. This one is also, but I've lightened it. So the, co the Caribbean turquoise is next, and this is another powerful phthalo family. Can I, the question's coming. Um, uh, which of these greens are transparent? So we started with them transparent, now I've put white in. Um, so the transparent ones are the phthalo green lake, and the Caribbean turquoise are both transparent to begin with and I'm now adding white so we can see them all next to each other with white in and see how they compare. So we're basically, in a way, we're, we're comparing cobalts with thalos here if you like. So we've got thalo green lake, Caribbean turquoise which is based on thalos and thalo cyanine turquoise at the end here and we're comparing them with the three cobalts in the middle which are softer and lower tint strength but still really really beautiful. So it's almost like the the Caribbean turquoise here is, is darker, it's a heavier, more dense colour somehow. And when I'm adding the white, it's, it's lightening and sort of flattening out a bit. It's amazing how they do all remain different from one another. Even with white in, this is still different from the phthalo turquoise. The differences are quite subtle. We were in Bermuda a while back and trying to match the colour of the sea there. It's amazing how many different pigments I was throwing in trying to get something that looked the right colour for it. Um, and then this end one is your phthalo turquoise, which already has some white, so I'll just put a little bit more to match the value of everything else. So I guess the next thing I could add is some yellows maybe, see where they go with a bit of yellow. Gosh, it's hard to know what to add next. Um, reds would kind of move them towards greys, neutrals. Let's just try a bit of yellow first and see what happens. I've got some bright yellow lake, that could be fun. Let's put some of that in. So bright yellow lake plus phthalo green lake is going to be loud. And dark, so I've gone back to the transparent colour there, so that's really vivid. Dark, very kind of artificial looking, very loud green. Gosh, kind of thing you see in awnings on shops and um, dyed fabrics and things. Let's try some bright green lake into cobalt teal. I use cobalt teal quite a lot when I'm mixing the colour of grass. I, would, I don't use it with this yellow lake. I may put a spot of the lead tin yellow lemon into it to make it more natural. But I do find it quite helpful because it's a mid-value green. And adding white to greens really does make them go very blue and minty. And that's not helpful for foliage. So I would use the cobalt teal with yellows. Um, to try and get mid-value greens without adding white. I find that quite helpful. Um, let's put some into, I don't suppose this will look much different, into the cobalt till blue shade. It's a bit richer, isn't it? Yeah, actually it is, it's deeper. Deeper and stronger. But not a massive difference. Let's try some yellow lake, bright yellow lake into 
cobalt turquoise deep now I'm just gonna put some back because because I've probably got too much there that might go too strong that's made a really nice green and that definitely belongs on a tree I think it's just a lower saturation color in the first place so it's producing a darker less vivid green in the, in the mix there into Caribbean turquoise it's probably just going to explode <laughs> into something quite lively that's not massively different from what I'm getting over here which makes sense because they're both based on thalos and they're both dark and transparent so it's not that different from get what I'm getting with the thalo green lake and then the last one we'll try it into the Caribbean turquoise which is pretty vivid the teals really pop though because they've got that mid value nature you know to begin with they're lighter than everything else and there's no white mixed in so it's a pure single pigment color that comes out mid value you get so much more richness this already has white mixed in and other other you know it's kind of the more pigments you put together the, the softer the colour becomes. So because these are pure single pigments in the first place, then just by adding another pigment, one other pigment, you're still getting quite strong colours. So let's just take these two side by side and see what happens. If we look at the um, cobalt teal on its own here, and then look at the cobalt teal blue shade, the newbie. Oh, look at that. There is a big difference, isn't there? You can really see that's more of a kind of, it's got sky blue kind of flavour to it. I could imagine using that in the sky actually. This I use, the co I use the cobalt teal sometimes in sunsets when it moves towards that really soft greenish note between the, the yellow and the top of the sky. And one of my favourite mixes is to put some lead tin yellow lemon into the cobalt teal. It's not the most useful colour in landscapes but it is just gorgeous. <laughs> so why not? And this isn't all about landscapes after all, it's just about colour. And there I'm going to put some into the blue shade and see. See that makes it behave more like the cobalt teal because it's lighter in yellow. Not a huge difference in that. But still just scrummy. Let's try some cobalt violet light. Let's try that in there, it just feels like it belongs. Wow. That's almost glowing like ultraviolet. That's amazing. So that's it into the blue shade. And there it goes into the cobalt teal. They're not mixing out that differently. Maybe they're just, they're, you know, they're just gorgeous in their own right. When I'm mixing them, it's like the differences aren't enormous, which I guess you wouldn't expect them to be. But as colours on their own, they're really yummy. And I think this um, blue shade could be really helpful for skies. Um, it's got a bit more of it. What happens if I push it towards blue just with a touch of the titanium white? I haven't got some squeezed out, but I just feel like I want to put some cobalt blue in and see how that goes. Just get the tube here. It's almost becoming a cobalt family mix. <laughs> Ooh, that's really nice. That's a real kind of summer sky blue. That could be very handy. Pushing it towards purple for the top of the sky, the deep purpley blue, and then towards something more greenish towards the horizon. That could be really handy. But actually, I'm just tempted to get a palette knife and put it down on its own. It's just yummy really yummy. <laughs> so if we come back to this row, um, I might just try some reds in. Let's just put a tiny splash of cad red in and see what happens when we neutralize them down a bit. I, th I find cad red is about the only thing I can do <laughs> to really tame the um, Thalo Green Lake. And I do find it does tame it down, but it always feels like that strong blue green. 
So I'm just going to put a little bit of red at the end of each line, see how it mixes in. So there it goes into phthalo turquoise. How's it going into the Caribbean turquoise? It's just darker all round and richer. A little bit here into the cobalt turquoise deep. This is a really soft colour, so it'll really probably go quite a long way towards the red. That's lovely though, that's like a real kind of soft teal colour. You can see that on furnishings. <laughs> this is into cobalt teal blue shade. That's great as well, actually. Somebody asking, can you do a mix with cobalt yellow? I don't have cobalt yellow. There's a rail in, which is, I guess, cobalt yellow. Let me try that. Um, I don't know if I can squeeze it into these now. I'll just put some in the middle there and try and do something with it. Um, yeah, I forgot that. We do have a cobalt yellow of sorts. Um, I'm getting covered in paint here. So this is a rail in, which is cobalt potassium nitrate. So I'm guessing it's what people mean when they say cobalt yellow, I've heard it referred to and I'm guessing this is the colour people mean. Aurelian's lovely in itself, it's, um, it's a really old pigment I think and it's transparent yellow so I'll just make sure this is really clean. Um, it's just lovely, it's just a sunshine yellow and mixed into these it should be quite fun. It's not going to be very different in the mixes from the bright yellow lake, though that's more acid, you can see. This is softer, more natural. It's like an egg yolk yellow. Um, but yeah, into the teals, it should be really yummy. Mix it into that cobalt teal there. That's great. I do think of colours as families, you know, particularly in terms of their tint strengths. Um, so these would be kind of in the middle area in my head. They're not really low tint strengths, but they're not massively high. I wonder how that behaves if we put it in with some of the violet. I bet that would be really pretty. So this is a railing with cobalt violet light. Oh, wow. That's so pretty. Really useful. And then if we push some of that into that blue mix... Oh, I could just push this around all day, it's great. <laughs> and now going into that cobalt teal mix a little bit. So this is really kind of cobalt family party going on. <laughs> it's really tasty. I feel like I want to just stop now and take some palette shots of that bit there. It's really yummy. So I think I probably need to have a clean up. I'm absolutely covered in paint here. <laughs> it's time to scrape it down again and think about what I want to mix next or what you want me to mix next, more importantly. Um, so as I'm cleaning down here, just jump in if you've any suggestions. I had a request for flesh tones, but there are a couple of quite quite busy flesh tone mixing videos on my YouTube channel, on Vicky Norman on YouTube. Um, you can find me here on Instagram on Vicky Norman Art. Um, I'll try and get, I think Mark's done a couple of comments there. So if you see Vicky Norman Art commenting and answering people, that's me. You can pop over and give me a follow. That's my, my own Instagram account when I'm not hijacking Michael Harding's. <laughs> um, and you'll also see if you pop onto my website, vickynormanstudio.com, that we're just about to launch um, an online art school with lots of bite-sized lessons on colour mixing, colour matching, all kinds of other things, brushwork, drawing. And I'm running some virtual holidays starting on Tuesday and I've still got some spaces. Because normally I'm away all summer teaching um, and travelling all over the world, obviously I'm not going this year. And I was sitting at home thinking of courses to deliver online, which we're having great fun teaching here from the studio. Um, and it's all going really well. And I was thinking, well, I'm really sad. I should have been in Provence this week and I'm really sad I'm not going. So I thought, well, let's just go together. Let's just pretend we're in Provence for two days. So <laughs> that's what we're going to do. I'm, I'm giving out loads of access to a folder with loads of images from my trips to Provence. Um, There'll be recipe ideas so we can cook ourselves suitable regional food to eat during the workshop days. 
I'll teach about things that would be useful if we were in Provence for painting olive trees and sunshine and villages and things. Um, and we're just basically going to pretend we're in Provence for two days. So if you fancy that, it's next Tuesday and Wednesday. You can find the details on vickynormanstudio.com in the workshops and events section and just grab yourself a ticket. Um, it's going to be really fun. So I'll be teaching for three hours a day and you'll have the rest of the time to make your own paintings. And we've got a Facebook group running where you can get critique on your work. It's all just been a huge adventure. It's really good fun, this online stuff. It's amazing that we can do this, isn't it, really? Um, so I'm doing a trip to Provence next week and then we'll have a virtual trip to Cornwall a couple of weeks after that because I should have been going down to the southwest of England to teach. Um, so I thought we'll go down there virtually to Poldark country. Um, so we're doing a couple of days in Cornwall and then Provence. I should have been off out to Italy in June so I decided let's have virtual Provence for a couple of days and I dare say we'll be doing more as the summer goes on. So do hop over there if you fancy coming on a little virtual painting trip with me. You can paint whatever you want from the photos or your own pictures. Uh, we're just going to make a little two day holiday from home. Okay, I'm nearly cleared up here. You can see it just spreads. We have some colour requests. Oh, we've got colour requests. Excellent. What have we got, Mark? Uh, pale violet. Pale violet is lurking on the end here. And just... also some oranges and reds, please. Okie dokie. Let's have a look. Well, I had a couple of questions about yellows, so let's put them together and make some oranges. Um, there are only really two oranges per se in the in the range here with Hardings. So there's the permanent orange and cadmium orange, um, which I do use on a YouTube video. I think there's a couple where they come up. Um, I think there's one just with permanent orange on its own. Actually, there's one of each uh, on YouTube for those. Um, so let's have a look at um, some Cad Yellow Deep, which I think is kind of bordering on an orange. And I do think it's a lovely colour. Um, versus, I've got Cad Golden Yellow here. Now they're close, but not the same. There's definitely a difference there. I've got a question. Have you ever been to Italy? Yes, I, I've had a question there, have I been to Italy? I adore Italy. I've been to Italy lots and lots, in fact. We've even threatened to go and live in Italy, though we wouldn't. Um, we love it here in Bridge North, but um, yeah, I absolutely adore Italy. I go most years to the northwest of Italy to, to teach and to paint. Um, this year I would have been teaching at the Watermill in Possara, very beautiful place. I'm just mucking around here um, with genuine vermilion which I can't just I can't just leave that sitting there, can I? <laughs> I've got to mess around with that. Let's take that white out so you can see everything against grey. Um, and I'm feeling like I just want to put some of this in there and start making a lovely orange. So vermilion is just so special. It's got something to do with volcanoes. It's just like magic paint. It's the most smooth buttery paint I think I've ever handled. The consistency of it. And it's just like liquid fire, but soft. It's got a gentleness to it. It's brilliant with this um, lead tin yellow lemon, probably my favourite colour ever. Um, and if you put them together, they just lend themselves straight towards flesh tones and portraits. They're such a pretty soft pink you get. Um, and if I then just incorporate some of that in there as well, we're getting a really lovely soft orange. So that's cow yellow deep with vermilion and a touch of that lead tin yellow lemon coming in, making a really lovely soft orange. The more vermilion we use, the pinker it's going to go. If I put it with cad red light, you'll see the difference side by side, the difference in the intensity. The vermilion just has that round, soft fullness to it. It's more autumnal. The cad red light with the Cad Yellow Deep just makes the best fiery orange red. It's fantastic. But it's much more saturated than that vermilion, just has a, a softness to it. It's definitely still an orangey red, but it's more of a burnt orange. It's, it's more gentle, it's more opaque as well somehow. Um, 
yeah, I just I could mix with this all day. Had a question. What time zone have you listed on your website for the virtual workshops next week? Oh, good, good question. Um, somebody's asking what time zone have I listed the times on the website? I'm in the UK, so that's English time. Um, so the workshop starts at 2 p.m. and I did that so that people on the East Coast, certainly of the US, can join us without having to get out of bed halfway through the night. <laughs> so that's UK time, 2, 2 p.m. kickoff for next week's workshops. So I don't know what I just put in there. I think that was card yellow golden, or maybe it was a rail in. <laughs> I've forgotten, I was too busy talking. Somebody will message and tell me what that was. Uh, but it's nice though, isn't it? It's great. This one here is um, the lead tin yellow light. So you can see the difference between lead tin yellow light, lead tin yellow lemon. And the light is just like a lovely cream vanilla colour. And that also mixes really nicely into the vermilion. But it's cooler. So there's the vermilion with the lead tin yellow lemon, and here it is with the lead tin yellow light. So it just doesn't go so orangey. It's a cooler, pinker mix. But again, you could see easily you could take that straight into a flesh tone. Something like a touch of raw sienna into that would take us straight into some really useful flesh colours. I'm back on my flesh tones again. <laughs> There's so many ways to make good flesh colours but I do find, I know they're expensive but the lead tin yellow lemon and the genuine vermilion, if you can do it, buy them. You, they're just the best ever for flesh colours. They just want to paint figures. If you put some cobalt violet deep in there, cobalt violet dark, look just straight into beautiful and it's the buttery quality of them. They're so smooth and the colours just so gentle, they're perfect for figure. And you can kind of leave them half stirred together because they're not so saturated. You don't have to work so hard to soften them down. You can leave a more active surface in the brushwork and the paint. They're just great colours. You've got a question, can you make some skin tones? Okay, that might be a few seconds behind. Someone's just asked me to make skin tones, but I think I've just done it. That's our little time lag there. So pale violet, somebody wanted to see pale violet, so let's try that over here. Here it is on its own. It's very similar to the value of the palette, um, mid-value. Um, with white, you can see it's a really pretty cold violet. Uh, with a yellow, it's going to grey out towards something more green-grey, probably. No, actually, it's going to a really nice neutral grey. It's not going green. So it's swallowing that aurelin. <laughs> so the aurelin's not so strong, it's a cobalt yellow. Let's give it a clout with some cad yellow instead. And that's really pretty. That's It's just a lovely colourful grey. Whereas I've got here the neutral grey. And if I put it there, you can see there's a difference. The grey we just mixed has more depth to it somehow. Not that there's anything wrong with neutral grey. Um, but it just works as a good kind of comparison to this grey we just made with the pale violet and yellow, which has just got more richness to it. And it's still got slight movement through it, some swirls of yellow bits and purpley bits. Question for me, what yellow did you mix? That was cadmium yellow golden I just put into that with the violet. So that's pale violet and cad yellow golden. And what colour is the purple? The purple pigment, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Um, I don't know. If you go onto Michael Harding's website, he's got tons of fabulous information there. And normally, when I'm going to do mixing videos, I swat up. But of course, because this is live, I didn't manage to swat up on the entire range all at once. So, so there's going to be a couple of I don't knows in here. But it'll be on the website. He'll tell you which pigments are in everything. I love that about the paint. They're completely honest. You know, he's not trying to pretend anything. He just tells you exactly what's in the paint. And he'll tell you a little bit about the pigment on the website. And you can learn masses just by spending an hour poking around on there and reading up on colours. And what's the colour name to look for for the purple? Pale Violet. Pale Violet is the name of that purple that you want to look for on there, if you're looking it up. Um, and this, I just somehow couldn't help myself but put some cadmium, no, hang on, I'm getting in the muddle now, cobalt teal blue shade I've just put into the Pale Violet there. 
without really even meaning to, it just happened and it's really yummy. Let's try some, what should we put in there? Hmm. Pink. See what happens if we put quinacridone rose into the pale violet. That's lovely. It's quite rich, high saturation. It's similar to the amethyst colour. If you put white into amethyst, you'd get something similar to that. It's great. Oh, well, I could keep going all day with this. So I'll do a few more minutes, I think, because I'm having so much fun and it's, mm. people are still there, I think. You're still yeah. asking questions, yeah. so I guess we'll keep going for a while. This is great. What a nice way to spend an afternoon. We should do this again. So if I clear some space in here. And then, so we've had requests uh, for reds and pinks, another one for pinks, and also maybe some greens. Greens, yes. I did have a couple of requests for sap greens. So I've done all my blue greens. Um, we will put this back up if we can figure out how as a story so you should be able to watch this for 24 hours if you've just joined and missed some of this um, so pinks let's think so there's the quinacridone rose we'll have a little look at that again and there's a brilliant pink we could do yeah. and for the greens there's a request for vir viridian okay viridian green well i've got a bit of Thalo green out here and that's not a bad comparison actually if I do some viridian green with some thalo I'm just getting all these blobs around the edges now that I can play with afterwards um, so just tidy up a bit I've seen Kwong Ho do this with his palette and he seems to have this magic razor blade that just sweeps the whole palette clean with one go but I've obviously not got the magic Kwong razor blade touch. I'm having to wipe up so much. So, <laughs> right, what are we doing? Greens, Greens and pinks. Yeah. Okay, brilliant pink is just scrummy. There's some brilliant pink, um, which is quinacridone and zinc and titanium white. Oh, I think probably now it's just titanium white. I think we'll have to stop putting zinc in mixes. Um, so brilliant pink is just brilliant on its own it's fab it mixes really nicely with that pale violet similar kind of family similar strength um, but you could easily mix it down into a brownish color as well let's think permanent sap green we're going to go there in a minute anyway so let's start now that will mix it down into something much more neutral it's almost got an umber note to it questions come in where's your palette knife from everybody always wants to ask where my palette knife's from someone's just asked so this is a number 81 rgm palette knife i get them from jackson's art supplies in the uk um it's it's just a bog standard one it's really not special i buy them about four at a time because if i drop it that's it if you bend the corner you've had it um and i do drop them so i always make sure i've got a couple of spares in the bag uh but yeah it's nothing fancy just, I think they cost about four pounds and they're great. There's brilliant pink with um, cadmium gold and yellow. Well, actually, it was a mixture of yellows, but mostly cad golden. And that's pretty yum. That's made a great kind of pink orange. Permanent orange makes a good pink orange as well. Let's put some more. Another good pink you can do is um, just white with. Rose Madder, beautiful colour. There's, there's one we had a request for earlier. Um, I just love Rose Madder. It's this gorgeous, soft, earthy, natural. It's just unique. There's nothing like it. It comes from the Madder root of a plant. Um, and it's just this, it's like a blood red. It's just gorgeous. It's transparent and fantastic for glazing. It's a really old colour. Look at that. It just speaks of Rembrandt, doesn't it? It's just beautiful. Um, Question, and it makes that, a great pink. Was that cad gold? The, somebody's questioning the last one. That was cad gold and yellow in that mix with brilliant pink. Cadmium gold and yellow. But this is the gorgeous rose madder. 
And if we try some of the cadmium golden into this, it could be yummy. And again, this is great for flesh. Um, if we put that in where the white goes into it, you can see immediately how useful that is. Rose madder is just delightful. It's just a wonderful, wonderful colour. And again, when we come to the, the current state of affairs with paints, it's really sad. Some companies are actually putting this in the tube. So this brilliant pink, basically, quinacridone pigments, as bright as these, and calling that rose madder. This is rose madder. This is the real thing, this beautiful soft brown red. When you're teaching people about colour and you ask them to go and buy rose madder, and they come back with that in a tube with a rose madder label, it's really sad, you know? It's really difficult to, to try and be a good teacher when people can't get the right materials with the right name on. Um, so this, this beautiful brown red here is rose madder. It's absolutely exquisite. Um, again, I'm afraid it's not one of the cheaper ones, but it's so worth it. Look at that, it's just delicious. If we put some um, cobalt blue in there, where did I put that? That was out there, wasn't it? Mm. Questions come in asking, uh, how long do they take to dry once they're on the canvas? Someone's just asked about drying speeds. Um, they vary drastically. So that whole cobalt family party we had there a few minutes ago, that would dry very fast. Cobalts dry quickly. Um, most of the earths are drying fairly quickly, so your siennas, ambers, ochres are pretty fast drying. Um, by that I mean they can be dry the next day, so I can't leave the brushes if I've been using raw umber um, or transparent oxides, red oxide, brown oxide, definitely need to wash the brushes out at the end of the session. If I'm using titanium white, it can be up to 10 days before it's really dry. The cadmium yellows, reds don't dry quite so fast. So it really varies massively from weeks to dry with the titaniums, especially if you put them down thick, to hours with the umbers. And I use the umbers and earths and cobalts as Sicative. I'll add them to a colour deliberately. You know, I'll add I'll add them to a mix to speed up the drying time. Neutral grey dries quite quick as well. I think there's something in that mix that's quite fast. So, um, if you look on the website again, or if you can get hold of one of Michael Harding's leaflets, but certainly on the website he tells you the drying time of all the colours, and some of them say very fast. And you can just add a spot of those to a mix, and it will make it dry really fast. The the cobalt family do dry quick. So these cobalt teals. Um, they'll dry pretty fast. Other colours can be much, much slower. Um, so it's always worth checking the drying speed, depending. If you're working on something and you want it to stay open, you know, if you're working on a studio portrait and somebody's coming back the following week, you can keep it cold. You can use slow drying colours and keep that portrait open for a good length of time. Or, you know, you can encourage a painting not to dry too fast by using different pigments and also by keeping it cold it really helps. Um, but um, equally, if you want something to dry really quick, if you're doing glazes and things, then you want to be looking at the faster drying pigments. As I'm talking, I'm just pushing some lead tin yellow lemon into the cobalt blue red um, rose madder mix here, just because I can't help myself. Got another question coming. Uh, what is the best way to achieve a very bright neon pink for realistic tropical flowers? They've tried magenta and quinacridone rose, but it needs to be brighter than that. Gosh, okay. Somebody's asking, what's the best way to get a really bright neon pink for tropical flowers? And they've tried quinacridone rose and magenta, it needs to be brighter. I would say at that point, the problem may be the colours around the flowers, because you can't go brighter than the paint straight out the tube. We, we are bound by the limitations of the pigments, and I would have said, those are your brightest pinks. Um, you can see with the quinacridone rose, if we put in a touch of white, or better still, the yellow actually gets us a more reddish note to it, but it is so bright, and it's never going to be quite as bright as an actual flower, but it's pretty bright. The white definitely will lift the colour, so using it straight out of the tube, it will be more dense, it's darker but its transparency makes it less vivid somehow, unless you're spreading it very thin in a glaze over a white surface. Um, but then it will really swing towards a more blue note in glazes. So um, if I get that white board back under here, you'll see what I mean. So there's a quinacridone rose spread really thin. Just grabbing the board here, folks. Okay, 
So there's a quinacridone rose here, spread really thin. See how it moves towards blue? And then if I add white to it, it will also move towards a blue. But if you want it warmer, like the colour of flower and sun, then by adding a yellow base, you can keep it more reddish. Um, but I do know the kind of purpley pinks this lady means. Um, sorry, I presume it's a lady. Um, but often just by lightening the colour a bit, you can make it appear more vivid. So there's a, a blue note to it, but there's also it's also darker and not so kind of iridescent looking if you do it without white. Just paint it thinly. Um, but I would suggest trying some greens alongside it to make it look redder, to make it look hotter. So it looks pretty bright, but if you put cobalt teal next to it, it looks brighter still. Use the opposite colours around to try and make them look stronger. So do that, or put darker colours beside, darker neutrals maybe. So I've got some lamp black here. Um, putting that beside will also make them appear stronger. So if you can't get any brighter than the paint you've got, then modify the things around it to try and make it feel stronger, feel brighter relative to everything around it. So you might be needing to push down the values in the vegetation around and you can see that colour starts to look stronger. That mark I just put in was the um, green, the permanent sap green. So we'll have a mess about because I did promise I'd do a green, didn't I? I've got completely carried away with myself. So there's a couple of questions while you're doing that. Gosh. Uh, what did you mix with the pale violet to make the lovely grey colour? That was, now can we remember, it was a yellow, it was cadmium golden yellow in there to make that nice soft grey. And if you can remember, what was the yellow you mixed to the vermilion? What was the yellow that went into the vermilion? Um, I used lead tin yellow lemon to make the lighter mix and then I used cadmium yellow deep to make that fiery burnt, um, burnt orangey mix. You'll be testing me on this. You'll be watching it back and going, no, you didn't. <laughs> I think that's what I did. And another question of Vermillion. Is there a poor man's Vermillion? Ah, oh, good question. Is there a poor man's Vermillion? I don't know if you can all hear Mark on the microphone, so I'm repeating all the questions here as best I can. Um, is there a poor man's Vermillion? Well, not exactly. I mean, none of the colours can be exactly replicated with mixtures. In theory, I can make a softer red. Um, I could do it with, let's have a look, what have we got with reds? I could do it with a yellow, a red lake. Let's have a look, see what happens. It's a good question, that. Um, find my red scarlet lake here. Have a muck around with it. So, here's a little mini tube of scarlet lake. So if I put it right next to the vermilion, you can see it's way more saturated to begin with. And what else is it? It's redder. The vermilion would be more orangey. So there's the vermilion. The vermilion's opaque. More opaque, I would say, than the red lake, scarlet lake. So to get there from here, or the other option, I guess, would be a naphthol red, which is also an orangey red, but it's totally transparent, or pretty much more transparent at least. She says, hastily reading the tube, what does it say? Oh, it says semi-opaque, there you go. <laughs> I put it out and thought that doesn't look very transparent. Okay, so here's the two other options, I guess. So Scarlet Lake, Napsol Red. The Napsol Red feels like it might be a bit closer, maybe somewhere between the two. This feels a bit too orange, this feels a bit too red, if you like. So if we put them together or went for one or the other. I would have to soften it somehow, so a tiny bit of white would flatten it out to make it more opaque, but of course straight away it swings away towards a blue. Let's get some more napsol orangey red, but at least we've sort of flattened it now and got that more opaque look to it, and I feel like I need to just make it more brownish. So possibly burnt sienna feels like it would go the right direction. Nothing in the world will behave just like vermilion or any other single pigment colour. That's what's so beautiful about them. They're all unique. But in terms of colour theory, you can mix a lower saturation orangey red. It's just a question of which ingredients you're going to put together. So I'm putting burnt sienna in here and it's sort of working. We're pretty close now. The mix I'm using is 
still more pinkish. So maybe a touch of a yellow. You could use a yellow lake if we're going with lower budget colours. It's still a bit more saturated, but you get the idea. So you can get there, but not with one sing single colour. There is no single pigment that will match it um, on a lower budget, but you can do it by using more colours if you have those colours, otherwise you can end up buying various different tubes to try and save money when you, you know, it kind of all stacks up, doesn't it? But but there, I'd say that's not a bad, so that was just another blob of burnt sienna in there to just soften it down. It's not a bad approximation of a vermilion mixed from other colours. So you can, there are many, many routes to each colour, especially a softer, less saturated colour. Some of the really vivid ones, like the quinacridones, you can't match that with anything else. Um, but the softer the colour, the more routes there are to get to something very similar. Um, it just takes a bit more time and more different pigments in there, I guess. The difference then is when you start to mix it with other colours, how it's going to behave then is what really makes a difference. So if we try again with the vermilion and the lead tin yellow lemon, that's where that goes. And the tint strength is medium, I'd say. It's not a terribly powerful colour. So, you know, neither of these are terribly strong colours, but they feel like they're quite well matched. Um, if I put the same kind of quantity into this, see where that goes. So the difference, you, you can match it in a pile, you know, side by side, but when you start to add other colours, then it starts to behave very differently. So that that's eaten up, that lead tin yellow. So this obviously is a stronger pigment mixture. Actually, colour-wise, it's not going miles away. Sometimes it'll swing in a completely different direction when you start to introduce other colours to it. But um, That's not too bad. We've had a technical question. Uh, why do the blue colours take much longer to dry than others? Somebody's asking why the blue colours take much longer to dry than others. I don't think they all do. It just depends. All the colours have different drying speeds and the cobalt blues actually dry really, really fast. Um, thalo blue is kind of medium. So some dry quicker than others. It just totally depends on the, the nature of each individual pigment. Hardings don't add any dryers or accelerants or retarders to the paints. It is literally pure pigment and linseed oil. So you get more variation in drying time among these paints than, than among some more standardised paints which have fillers and dryers and all sorts of other things in them to try and even them out. But personally, I would rather just be using the pigment than all the other stuff with it. Um, so it means that they behave more like individual characters. They have their own drying speeds, their own nature. Um, and it doesn't take long to get used to them. Um, I guess it depends how many different colours you need to learn to use. I start with quite a small range of colours and then I've built myself up over time, introducing one at a time and getting to know them like this, mixing them with other colours. Okay, one last mix here with the um, sap green. So any last questions now? I'm going to start wrapping up, I think. Although I could quite happily mix all afternoon. <laughs> I should give Hardings their channel back. So, um, permanent sap green. I had this on my list from the beginning and I forgot it for a little while. I did have a list of names, people that sent in some of the suggestions. So this was Steph the Artist and EU Aussie were asking for sap green. Um, the Burnt Sienna was GL Garcia. Thank you for the suggestions, folks. Um, it's been really fun, actually. I've had some mixes here I wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, who else did we have? Cindy Paints, Zeb Posada, Alex Fish, EU Aussie again were suggesting some of these turquoises and greens that prompted that like for like session earlier on. Seems like ages ago now. Um, and this sap green, yeah, we've done that. So that's Steph. Steph and EU Aussie were asking for this sap green. So here it is. Um, on its own, it's almost black. So I instinctively just put some white in to try and show you what the colour is. And it's a mixture of phthalo green with a bit of red oxide. Um, so it's a, a kind of soft, or it might be a brown oxide, but it's a soft green, you know, a fairly natural kind of olivey green. Um, with yellows, like a bright yellow lake or something, you can really pep it up. It doesn't want to swing too much towards a blue green because that oxide in there is really quite powerful. So it's really desaturated it down to more of a brownish green. Um, so there it is with 
yellow lake and possibly with white you could get it towards something a bit more grass green and vivid. It will grey or 